Let me ask you a question. So how would we know if we've got an infection? So the most common obvious signs are inflammation, redness, swelling, and pain. The problem is all of those things could be caused by something else. How can you tell if your immune system is activating in response to something that should be benign, like dust, or whether it's reacting to something virulent? The answer is it's not particularly easy. You certainly can't tell about testing, and often it's not even tested. Now that's understood by mainstream medicine that it could be either. What's less understood by mainstream medicine is it could be a poison. Welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, creator and founder of Feel Younger and Genetic Insights, Elwin Robinson. And today we are discussing the important role that pathogens and infections play in creating optimal health. So tell me, Elwin, why did you want to discuss this topic today? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I feel like underlying unresolved chronic infections are probably significantly underemphasizing their importance for health, both within the mainstream medical community, who is not really too concerned with infections, usually unless they're acute. And we'll talk about what the difference are between those very soon, I'm sure. Um, and th But then also in the kind of uh, mainstream alternative health world, where there's a lot of focus on, you know, stuff like if you just eat this diet, then everything will be great. And there's a lot of people, I think, confused about why that's not true for them. And then like they try a different diet from a different person who says, all you got to do is eat this diet and everything will be good. And, you know, ditto for herbal protocols and fitness regimes and all the rest of it. And uh, as I said in previous episodes, I don't feel like infections, chronic infections is usually the first thing to start with, although there are, you know, very um, helpful, valid systems out there that disagree with me on that. Like, for instance, the whole functional medicine system the first step in their kind of protocol generally is to folk, uh, look at what chronic infections are and remove them. Uh, but that's not normally what I would do, and I'll explain why during this episode. But nonetheless, I feel like uh, underlying chronic infections and or underlying toxicity, and they quite go, often go hand in hand, are not necessarily the very first thing you should focus on when you're trying to sort out your health. But they are one of those things that must be resolved ultimately, otherwise your health won't get better in many cases. Um, generally, I don't start with it because if it's possible that, you know, a few simple lifestyle changes like cleaning up your diet, stop drinking as much, stop smoking, whatever, if that stuff is enough for you to feel fantastic, then great. Because honestly, trying to deal with toxins and trying to deal with underlying infections is often a bit of a minefield. But for those who have tried the kind of basic advice and it may have worked to some degree, but it's not enough, and I was really in that category, um, you then got to go hunting and go, okay, what else is going on that's preventing me from feeling as good as I could? And then often uh, chronic underlying infections are a big deal. And also the vast majority of people have them. I mean, you know, spoiler alert, one of the things we'll talk about is uh, inf oral infections, infections in the mouth. And, you know, estimates are anything from 90 to 98% of people have chronic infections in their mouth. And that's not good for all kinds of reasons that we'll get into. So, yeah, I think almost everyone suffers from it. Some people, it's a much bigger deal than other people, but everyone could improve their health by um, doing that. And then, yeah, after we go through all the stuff about un understanding infections, I want to give... Uh, I want to go through each of the different areas where we tend to get chronic infections, whether it's sinuses, ears, uh, urinary tracts, lungs, intestines, whatever, and then give like specific recommendations for each of those areas as well. So we're going to talk theory, but we're going to talk a good amount of uh, practical advice as well. Wonderful. No, I'm really looking forward to this. I know it's been been something that we've been wanting to discuss for a long time, so I'm glad we're bringing it to our listeners today. So Let's kick it off. What causes infections? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, um, let me just talk historically for a second, because our current understanding of infections is very, very new. So throughout history, infection the, or the symptoms of infection have generally been attributed to um, constitutional elements um, or some kind of uh, malevolent uh, element. So constitutional means, so in the kind of Western world, we had the humors. We had like phlegmatic, uh, sanguine, choleric, and uh, the other one, uh, melancholic. 
And so the idea would be if you're too far in one direction, and they would relate those to different um, uh, uh, human digestive. So phlegmatic comes from the word phlegm, for instance, and um, choleric would come from col, which is uh, the um, liver, so that would be bile. So the idea would be you have too much of one of these substances, whether it's phlegm or bile or whatever, and then that affects your, your personality and your outlook and all the rest of it, but it also creates disease. Well, that's actually a very similar system to what they have in India with Ayurveda going back thousands of years. So they had the doshas, the diff again, different kind of constitutional. If you have too much of pitta, you're not enough of vata or whatever. So that kind of imbalance, that's the root of disease. And then in traditional Chinese medicine, again, going back thousands of years, they had similar idea again, both of constitution with the five elements being out of balance. And then, you know, both of those systems as well, but I'm more familiar with the Chinese, would also have the idea more of like an invasion of something. But rather than thinking of it as tiny little organisms, they would say, you know, you've got an invasion of evil wind, for instance. <laughs> That's uh, There's all kinds of evil winds that cause disease. Uh, but it could also be, you know, too much heat, too much cold, too much dry. And so that would be how they would look at things. Now, I'll say all that because we're kind of laughing a little bit, but... There are still certain conditions, even now in the West, that are more effectively treated using those kind of models for understanding disease than the Western model, right? There are certain things that things like acupuncture and Chinese herbs and Ayurvedic, uh, you know, cleansing techniques or Ayurvedic massage or whatever are actually more effective at treating in at least some cases. So um it's kind of an alien way for most of us to think of it but you know that has some input as well that that has some possibility as well and then there is the idea of evil spirits demons curses as well all of that kind of stuff throughout most of our history uh, i say we you know people of a european background but actually people of any background pretty much in any culture throughout the world and in fact in many cultures throughout the world i think especially africa a lot of East Asia, a lot of indigenous cultures, this is still their primary way of looking at the cause of all disease. And again, I'm not mocking it because in some cases they're actually more effective no. at treating these things than we are. Um, so, you know, um, so this is the idea. Now, we'll talk about this, you know, a little bit in this episode, but I think we'll talk about it more in a different episode. But, you know, the mindset that you have is is very key. So certainly if you believe you're cursed or if you believe you're affected by evil spirits or, or whatever, that certainly can create the, the you know disease in your body. Um, but anyway, that was a kind of idea up until relatively recently, like about 150-ish years ago. And there were a few kind of crazy people maybe around 200 years ago who started to get an inkling that there might be something else going on. And that there may actually be these tiny little organisms, which if they uh, infect or if they spread from one place, maybe where they're supposed to be, like the dirt or in feces or something like that, in, uh, or a dead body, into another place they're not supposed to be, like especially inside you know, your body, <laughs> inside a human body, then that could be the cause of disease. And to begin with, in the whole medical establishment, that was completely dismissed, ridiculed, humiliated. Um, and I can't remember the name. I didn't do the research on the history bit. Don't worry, I've done the research on the practical stuff when we get to that. Um, but, uh, you know, the, yeah, there was a doctor who uh, he spent his life trying to persuade other doctors basically to wash their hands between handling dead bodies and then give, helping to uh, give birth to children. And he was, you know, hated and ridiculed and no one listened to him, basically. And he was, um, I think he was drummed out of the medical profession. So this goes back up to um, what the physicist Feinstein said of a, a lot of the time scientific progress happens one funeral at a time. Meaning that, you know, often people, once they're in a position of authority and established and all the rest of it, like they just are unwilling to accept new evidence no matter what and Basically, you're going to wait until new people come along who are more open-minded. It's like a generational thing. Um, anyway, so the person who really took out that cause successfully was a guy called Pasteur. And most people, you might have heard of him because it's where the word pasteurized or pasteurization comes from that most of us have heard of. So pasteurization is just where you heat something to a very high heat, sometimes very quickly, called flash pasteurization, to kill 
microorganisms that may be harmful, but in fact, kill all microorganisms in most cases. But even anyway, the beneficial ones. Even the beneficial ones, yes. Um, so Pasteur was very much of the mind that um, it was these pathogenic, so pathogenic uh, means disease causing, that's all. So there's many types of microorganisms. Most of them are pretty much indifferent to us, neither good nor bad. And then there's a minority that are bad for us, pathogenic. And then there's a minority that are good for us, often called like probiotic, because usually it's bacteria, but sometimes you know, there's beneficial yeasts as well or whatever. Um, and so that was Pasteur's perspective. But he did have some, you know, uh, contest at the time philosophically from a guy called Bouchamp, who was saying that kind of more the old style, which is why I mentioned it right at the beginning of constitutions and humors and stuff, that the issue is not so much the invading organism that causes disease, but it's the, um, it's the terrain that's the issue. So meaning, and his justification for that was uh, you can expose a group of different people to a pathogen, but they won't all get ill. And so if they're not all getting ill, there must be something about the person that means that they are susceptible to getting ill from that organism. And so, you know, you and I have discussed this, I think, on the podcast before, Chris, and, and as you correctly said straight away, it's like, aren't they both right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is yes, to some degree, obviously, right? Even the most virulent uh, pathogen, meaning, you know, very easy to contract, is never a hundred percent contraction rate. It's always like ninety eight percent or ninety nine percent. There's always a few people who are resistant to it, um, and there are a lot of things that are actually are very difficult for people to contract. So there is definitely some evidence that says there's more to it than only exposure to the pathogen. Right? You can have someone who's ill with a respiratory disease, for instance, sneeze on you, and it's not guaranteed that you'll get ill, even though you've just breathed in a bunch of their bacteria. Uh, or, you know, viruses or whatever it may be. Um, so that's the big debate. I won't go into that too much here because, you know, as I said, we want to get to practicality soon. But that's the thing to really understand that underlies it. Because as you said, Chrissy, uh, both are important. We, we do actually have to address both. Now, the mainstream medical community does not. So the next big shift to happen in that regard uh, was the, in, uh, the invention or discovery it's probably a better word for it initially and then later invention of antibiotics, right? So this was supposedly accidental. The first antibiotic penicillin was actually, uh, it's actually a mycotoxin. So meaning it is a toxin created by mold. And so this is because a lot of these microorganisms, and we're gonna, I think we're going to list them in a minute, um, are constantly at war with each other, just like lots of animals and humans are. Um, and the way that, you know, the way that humans maybe do war these days is through, I don't know, computer viruses and stuff like that, as well as bombs. The way that animals do war is generally, you know, a lot of hitting each other. But the way that microorganisms do war is through poisoning each other. So they will create poisons to try and kill each other with. And right, so, so it's their, their go-to defense strategy. Yeah, defense and offensive, you know, so yeah, also right. to attack others. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and generally the most um, poisonous of the poisons in terms of sheer, you know, poison power per, uh, vol you know, volume or weight is the mycotoxins. The moles are particularly good at creating particularly virulent toxins. And so that was an advantage. So a mold decided it wanted to create something to kill bacteria. We discovered that and we utilized that for ourselves to kill bacteria. It's easy in this day and age to take antibiotics for granted, but we can't forget what an absolutely huge shift they at least seemed to be back when they were first discovered. I'll explain why I say seem to uh, soon, but it's because at the point that they were discovered still, the most common cause of death was some kind of infectious disease. By this time, you know, the existence of bacteria and other mm -hmm. microorganisms have been proven and, you know, catalogued and all the rest of it, right? Um, and so, although there's some controversy even regarding that, whether all the diseases that are now considered infectious definitely necessarily were, and how there could still be confusion with all the advanced science, 
I'll get to that. We'll talk about that. Um, <laughs> but basically, yeah, there's... Um, uh, because antibiotics seem to be so effective, because most people were dying of infectious diseases, because they were effective at dealing with a lot of those infectious diseases, absolutely. Um, they, the whole tone of science and medicine shifted. Before, it wasn't like definitely in the camp of Pasteur or Bouchamp. There was quite a little bit of both, you know, like things like, uh, you know, vitamin therapy and stuff like that was still a part of the mainstream medical community just over 100 years ago. But all of that shifted when we went into, uh, uh, when we discovered antibiotics. That was a huge thing. So then the whole, you know, medical uh, establishment really went to, okay, disease is caused by infectious agents. And that's still a problem in this day and age. So as infectious diseases became conquered, people still were dying. Now, the uh, average age of death has got higher since the invention of antibiotics, but that seems to be largely because the rate of infant mortality went down a lot. So there's a lot less children dying at, during childbirth or at a very young age. But if you remove that, the average age that we live to, someone who survived to, up to the point of, say, one years old, or people in that category, our average age has not gone up that much, even depending on the country and all the rest of it, even though we conquered pretty much the main thing that used to kill us. So how is that possible? Well, that happened because we started dying of chronic diseases instead, rather than infectious diseases. So instead of uh, uh, you know polio and uh, TB and pneumonia and all this kind of stuff, you know, large people dying of that kind of stuff, uh, and even, you know, the more simple infections, like people used to die of tooth infections and ear infections and all that kind of stuff. So instead of all that kind of stuff, we started dying instead of heart disease and the, the neoplasm and, and, you know, even uh, poisoning is the third right. most um, documented cause of death, which includes doctor-induced poisoning as well as self-induced poisoning, whether it's drug overdose or whatever. So where most of the diseases we die of these days are chronic diseases. We listed this recently in the episodes where we did the Rejuvenate Blueprint, but uh, I think eight or nine out of ten of the top ten things that kill us, including all top three, four, five, um, are all chronic diseases, not infection-based. So why am I saying this? Why am I talking about this? Because I think one of the many reasons for that is that our emphasis went so much into seeing infections as being the important thing that then we started uh, so then there was the theory of so then to go back to that question for a second well why do some people get diseases and not others so the dominant paradigm that settled into the mainstream about that the answer to that question was because of the immune system some people have a stronger immune system to uh, resist those invaders some people have a weaker immune system so because that was the dominant paradigm then the question came well how can we strengthen the immune system to resist those invaders. And that's where the whole vaccination thing became such a big part of mainstream medicine because it's let's give people a small amount of um, usually a dead form of that infectious agent but so that the body creates antibodies to prevent so that when the actual infection comes along, it's already ready and doesn't get very sick. The problem is the body can tell the difference between a dead uh, bacteria or whatever and a live one and so they have to add a load of poison with it to stimulate the immune system enough for it to bother sending antibodies to these dead or you know microorganisms that you're in injecting inside them if you believe that infectious disease is the biggest issue and that strengthening the immune system is the biggest solution then this strategy totally makes sense so do you see, from a Pasteurian paradigm, this is the wise thing to do. But what about if the terrain is more important? What about, Very great question. <laughs> what about if poison, in, you know, various types of poison are more of a significant factor than we think? Is adding in more poisons in any form, whether it's jabs or any other drugs, even if they seem to be helping, is that a good strategy overall long term? And I'm not going to give the answer to that question because I honestly don't know for sure and I honestly do think it's a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not one of those people who thinks that um, if you just 
don't have any jabs, everything is great. And I feel like I'm the proof of that because my, my mother was dead against um, any kind of vaccination. I had almost none. And I'm definitely not a picture of health. So this idea that, you know, that all our problems, <laughs> all our chronic health problems are created by that. I don't believe it from my own experience, right? I still had health issues. So of I'm course, not... But then there's, there's also other factors too that can be contributing to that as well. It's not necessarily of course. just that. Af yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I poison myself in all kinds of other ways, right? So this is what I'm saying. There's, there's, there's more poisons than only the ones that the medical establishment wants but to here's, give you. Here's the point though. What if your mom had been, you know, pro-vaccine, what kind of health position would you have been in then? Well, I don't know. That's exactly. the question. So, all, I, all I know yeah. for sure is that not having any didn't mean that everything was suddenly rosy, which is what yeah. some people are saying. Yeah. But could it have been substantially worse? Yes. Exactly. Could it have been substantially better? Maybe even for the pro-vaccine people. Yeah. Yes, maybe. So yeah. I don't know that for sure. This episode is not really about that. Uh, because I'm not an expert in it, I'd like to get someone on who is. But I just wanted to, because I know that's extremely, what's the word, controversial and in a lot of people's minds right now, I just wanted to touch upon it to explain how all of that controversy is based on this fundamental history and underpinning that we just addressed and that we just talked about. And I, as you said, Chrissy, I'm actually not on one side or on the other with this not because i'm trying to be diplomatic because i honestly think that they both have value Precisely. Um, i am totally happy to take antibiotics i'm not even necessarily against vaccinations for me or anyone else depending on the context depending on the situation um i do think people should be informed when they do things but that's really as far as i go on it uh, i'm not against any kind of medical drugs necessarily i'm not against any kind of antibiotic antifungal anti anything in fact i'm going to be recommending some of them as we go through but I also don't think that acting as if that is all that matters or all that, you know, the vast majority of what matters is wise either. And so we're going to be talking really from both perspectives when we uh, when we give it, uh, advice here. I'm glad that you went through that whole um, education or discussion on that, because what that also does do for me and in my mind and hopefully for the listener is take a moment to pause and go, oh, and consider and think about it and go, okay, here's where it all started from and stemmed from. And that there's also more to consider, which is, you know, why we do this, why we bring this. So that's great. Thank you for going into such detail on, uh, on that one, what seemed like a very sim simple question. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. Um, so, okay, we discussed what infections are and the history there. Um, and you also touched on the topics of, you know, because, I, you know, a long time ago, people would just die, as you mentioned, would just die from a simple infection. And it looks like the progress of antibiotics, hand washing, sanitation, things like that have helped people, you know, to, you know, not pass away from those things. So in, in that, is there anything else that you want to touch on as far as the mortality rate of individuals in relating to that before we go on to the um, next question. Yeah, I think so. So again, I'm not an expert on this. So I'd like to bring on someone who is. But from what I've seen, so when we talk about why is the infection rate so low, um, I think the people who are pro-vaccine would like to say it's largely due to vaccination. Um, I think other people would like to say it's largely down to antibiotics. I I think that both of those things have had an effect. But from the research that I've seen, the actually the biggest difference in um, reduction of deaths and disease, serious disease from infectious agents comes from um, hygiene more than anything else. Having clean water, clean sewage, uh, you know, as you say, ability to wash, wash what you know, wash the things that you eat with clean water, all of that kind of stuff, basically. But clean water and sanitation really being the fundamental elements that then, if you don't have clean water, then everything that you clean is not really clean. You know, it's like a really fundamental thing. And one of the things that supports that is that the whole world doesn't have those things still, and the areas of the world where there is not that clean water and clean sanitation, there is still a substantial portion of people sometimes even a majority of people dying of infectious disease um, despite having access in at least some cases to antibiotics and uh, uh, vaccines and um, you know as I said I, I'm also fairly convinced by looking at uh, you know graphs that show the introduction of these different 
um, interventions, like what roughly what date they became prominent, and then looking at the rate of infection, you know, people dying of these different infections. And it seems to be when the hygiene measures are in place that there's this massive drop. Not and sometimes nutrition actually. Sorry, that's the other factor. Sometimes nutrition as well. Uh, we forget, you know, because these days we talk about how our food is empty calories and all the rest of it, which is true. But we forget that, you know, 100 years ago for our culture and still now for some cultures, nutrition is not about, oh, God, you know, I should stop eating empty calories and eat some real food. Nutrition is about there's no nutrition. <laughs> there's nothing available, you know, like starvation or starvation of, you know, the nutrients that you actually need just to survive, let alone to thrive. In the so-called developed world, we're often lacking the nutrients we need to thrive, which is why we have all these chronic diseases. But in some of other, you know, other parts of the world, and in our part of the world as well, you know, hundred years ish ago, and uh, maybe a little bit more, we lack the nutrition that we needed to even survive, let alone thrive. And that's why there was, you know, we talked before about the food fortification progress programs, like, you know, the fact that they put B one and B three in grains because, you know. 100 years ago, there were a lot of people dying of beriberi and pellagra, you know, and uh, scurvy and rickets and all this kind of stuff. So um, uh, cretinism, all, all kinds of things that were easily resolved just by giving people basic nutrition. So the combination of basic nutrition, which is a kind of terrain issue, um, along with hygiene, those interventions, if you actually track the grasp, graph of diseases, often had a much more significant impact than what we think of even me sometimes i'm guilty of this with antibiotics i think oh you know antibiotics that's when we stopped having infectious diseases but when i i think i might have said it before on one of these podcasts but when i really looked into it and again i'm no expert i'd like to get a real expert on but when i really looked into it it sure seemed to me that it was the hygiene and the nutrition which were the more important factors those are all really really good points okay okay so then let me ask you this, and let's take it in this direction. Um, you know, obviously these pathogens, these, these things are out there. You know, what can somebody do to avoid these infections or these pathogenic, um, you know, things? It's a good question because prevention is uh, always better than cure. It's always a lot easier. Um, so I guess there's two kind of mentalities that you can take with this. And again, rather than saying which is right or which is wrong, I'll briefly say both, right? So the more pastorian mentality is the one that we've really seen <laughs> play out in this world in the last few years, which is avoid transmission, right? So being, you know, six feet away from the nearest person, wearing a mask, maybe having an air purifier running, uh, making sure you wash your hands before you put them in your mouth, before you touch your face, all of that kind of hygiene stuff. And I'm not dismissing that. I think you can overwash your hands and dry them out and stuff like that. But, I, you know, definitely it's a good idea to wash your hands before you stick them in your mouth and before you prepare food which you stick in your mouth. I actually do 100% agree with that. Um, funnily enough, I learned that from an alternative person, Holder Clark, not, you know, any kind of mainstream. That she really hammers home that point about how easy it is to get, you know, infected and stuff. And I took that to heart quite a few years ago. So... I am a big fan of that stuff. Um, I uh, Just on that note, by the way, soap and water is a hell of a lot better than those kind of um, antibacterial uh, hand wash things, those, um, uh, what are they called? Where you rub gel sanitizers. on your hands. Sanitizers. Yeah, thank the you, alcohols, sanitizers. Yeah. yeah, I've seen a lot of research and evidence that those are really bad and detrimental in their effects on your health. Um, so I'd just recommend the good old fashioned hand washing rather than, um, those sanitizers, but so all of that kind of stuff, right. And it's true. I'm not, I know some people are like, Hey, if you're ill, come here and give me a hug, sneeze all over me. I'm so confident it's not going to affect me. I'm not that guy. I don't have that level of health and vitality. Unfortunately. Um, I do believe it's possible to have that level of health and vitality where you are, uh, you know, immune no matter what I think being you know unless you're in that superhuman level uh which few people are then it is wise to not like <laughs> you know be kissing people who are currently have an active infection in their mouth or you know whatever that's that seems kind of smart to me um so there's the avoiding transmission that's strategy number one right 
Now, strategy number two, which again, I would say is a, as well rather than instead, is really all the stuff that I teach in my rejuvenation blueprint, which I think, you know, uh, has just come out recently in the episodes. And I am working on a book right now that will um, explicate those more fully. And so just a, you know, quick recap. So strengthening yourself. So optimizing your nutrients. You know, there are many different nutrients which are commonly thought of as supporting the immune system, like, you know, vitamin D3 and zinc, most famously. Um, but the truth is, any nutrient that you're low in, which could even be an individual amino acid or, or whatever, will compromise your health if you're genuinely low in it. And any nutrient that you even have a suboptimal amount of will to some degree make you have suboptimal levels of overall health and therefore also overall levels of immunity so getting the nutrients that you need um lowering your toxic backlog so there's kind of two types of toxins that you have to deal with there's like the ones in circulation right now whether that circulation is in your your blood circulatory system, whether that's in your lymph system, whether that's in your digestive system, which we're going to talk about. So that's the kind of ones that are already affecting you. But then there's also the ones in storage, which are undermining your health, but that you may not notice at all, like in your fat cells, in your, you know, stored in various organs, like your liver and your kidneys and all the rest of it that you may not really notice because it's just normal to you, but you would be doing a lot better if you actually manage to get rid of them. But they don't necessarily make you feel bad in the moment. When they're in storage, they don't really make you feel bad. They just make you low level, not as good as you could be. When they're actually released into your bloodstream, into your lymph, into your system, then they make you feel bad. So having that toxic backlog, especially if you have them in your circulation, that's going to make you more susceptible to illness. Having balanced hormones. We talked about this before. Um, having some levels, high levels of some hormones chronically, like cortisol and estrogen and prolactin and all the rest of it, we've talked about this in many episodes, will undermine your immune system. Having, you know, good high levels of some other hormones like progesterone and testosterone will help to support the health of your immune system. Basically, to simplify it, if your body is in a stressed, inflamed state hormonally, that means that your immune system is dysregulated and it's not going to function as well. It both means that it will be less effective at fighting off invaders, but actually more importantly in this day and age, because if your immune system is ineffective at fighting off an invader, usually there is a drug that will do it for you, whether it's an antibiotic, antifungal, whatever. But the issue is more that your immune system is dysregulated and it overreacts to the... Um, invader and so that's with the recent uh uh you know worldwide pandemic thing the, the the people who are dying of that it's not so much because the infection killed them it's their own immune system's response to the infection that kills them usually what they call the cytokine storm and stuff like that so um having that immune system regulated is very important and hormones and neurotransmitters and peptides all of those play an important role in that we'll talk about that a little bit more peptides anyway when we talk about practicalities um having a balanced lifestyle so circadian rhythm is a big part of that uh being one of my achilles heels that i'm doing better with that now but you know getting up when the sun rises and go, going to sleep when it sets obviously not as easy to do say in the middle of winter if you live in a norm northern climate where you only have eight hours of light so you know do your best within that but ultimately getting some sunlight in the morning especially and getting some before sunset in your eyes and you know actually being outside not just through the window stuff like that getting enough sleep not being overly stressed all the usual lifestyle advice you've probably heard from everyone will absolutely have an effect on your immune system and certainly definitely the you know the few things i just mentioned are very significant um and then a positive attitude so we talked about that before and we'll talk about it more in future episodes but the placebo effect is huge. So this is where you know I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago about some people who have this belief that no matter what, they won't get infected. If you really have that belief very strongly, it's not guaranteed that you won't, but it is definitely less significantly less likely that you get it if you have that strong belief. If it's a real belief, not a delusional thing, but let's say if you never get sick, if you never get infectious disease, 
you haven't done for 10, 20 years, I've met plenty of people like that, then that's going to create a very real solid belief in you based on a lot of evidence and experience and memory, right? And then that really does carry you that, you know, you're much less likely to, to get it because you so strongly believe that you don't. And the opposite is also true. You know, if you are a hypochondriac, um, then, you know, if you believe every, every single illness that you hear about, you assume that you have it, it does make you more susceptible. So, how, you know, an attitude uh, makes a difference as well. And that's a very, very brief recap, but I do recommend you watch the Rejuvenate Blueprint videos um, in full and ideally get the book once it's out so that you can, um, you know, really learn about it. Because this is ultimately the key to how to avoid everything, not just infections, but it <laughs> definitely includes infections. I hear you when to say that, you know, those things are really important to um, avoid the infections. But then, you know, how can somebody, you know, let's say somebody's doing that, you know, how can they also make themselves, I don't know, maybe this is the same answer to, to what you just said, make themselves less susceptible to these kinds of infections? Yeah, basically. Yeah. I mean, I think I answered both those questions. So the avoid was more the hygiene and, the, yeah. you know, the, the boundaries with people who are ill and stuff like that. But yeah, the less susceptible is really um, all those steps in the rejuvenation blueprint. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have for most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenateme for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenateme at feelyounger.net. Going deeper and looking at these infections, you know, what's the difference between bacterial, viral, parasitic, and fungal infections? Uh, yeah, and you can add to that yeast, mold, uh, protozoa, um, and then, you know, probably other stuff as well that I'm not as familiar with. But yeah, those, those are good kind of classifications. Often yeast and um, mold are lumped along with fungal. Uh, yeah, they're just different type of uh, organisms, fundamentally. So... Uh, a lot of the differences, you know, obviously in function, but, you know, size is a significant thing as well. Um, I won't get too much into, you know, all the science behind it or whatever, because I think what's more relevant for most people is the practical, you know. So they, to some degree, require different strategies to deal with. That's the important point. Um, now, in terms of what we just said, you know, all of the rejuvenation blueprint steps, that's exactly the same <laughs> for all of those organisms. There's really no difference. Um, so back, you know, uh, bacteria are a, a microorganism that is tiny, but that has its own kind of existence and intelligence with, uh, independent of you. Um, bacteria is something that you cannot avoid. You will, you have many trillions of them inside you. You know, there's estimates of, you have 10 times as many bacteria cells inside you as you do human cells. So bacteria is not something you can be free of. That's something I think that's kind of shaken the whole pasteurian underpinnings of the modern medical system is the last couple of decades, the, this, you know, discovery and, um, cataloging of the microbiome and understanding that there's inevitably going to be a lot of bacteria inside you. Um, viruses don't have the same status as bacteria in that sense. So a couple of differences for a start, viruses don't exist independent of you so they're more like um they, they, they don't have their own cells they don't have the, so what they do is that they they have their own genetic code but they go in and invade your cells and take them over so it's kind of like a cuckoo or uh like a zombie or a vampire or something like that where it doesn't have life of its own it has to go in and kind of take over i think cuckoo is probably the best analogy so we're like the host for that viral cell yeah exactly well no it's not a cell that's cell. that is the thing the yeah. cell is the host for the virus cell. and yeah it can only uh, replicate through our cells or through another organism's cells a quick point quick and uh, sorry if i detract here 
Can we ever get rid of viruses? What, inside our cells? Yeah. Uh, not 100%, but they're not in the category of bacteria where um, uh, like they're an essential part or possibly, probably an essential part of being a human orga organism. Um, so uh, as far as I understand, if you were to wave a magic wand over yourself and remove all viruses, it wouldn't be as catastrophic as doing exactly the same thing with bacteria. Now, viruses are interesting because... I realize it's going to make me sound a bit kooky, but I'm going to say it anyway. I don't know about this. So I'd like to get an expert on, but I've come across reasonably interesting evidence that there's no such thing as viruses. <laughs> Whoa, okay. <laughs> That's a statement. Let me clarify that. Not that there's no such thing as viruses, but that they are not um, beings who have like independent... Consciousness. Consciousness, intent, stuff like that, that... They're basically just a bunch of like programming. Um, they're, they're basically just, um, yeah, strings of amino acids that, that have a specific programming, but they're not uh, like a thing that actually comes in and consciously tries to invade you. Now, you could say bacteria don't consciously try and do anything, but bac bacteria have their own will. They have their own intent. You know, they have their own desire, for want of a better word. They have their own agenda. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. Um, with viruses, you know, there are some people who say that what we think of as viruses is just a degradation of our own um, DNA. Now, I'm not going to try and push that. I'm only mentioning it in case there are very open-minded people who are curious to look into it themselves. Uh, there's a book about it. I can't remember the title of Chrissy, but I'll give it to you to, to add to the uh, show notes. Uh, in fact, there's many books about it, but there's one that I happen to have read. And, you know, some of the evidence for it is, is what I just said, right? They can't exist without having some kind of other host. And, you know, they act in a very different way from the other types of microorganisms that we're talking about. And so it's not 100% sure it is an organism. Now, that's one of those things where it kind of defies the whole underpinnings of the kind of mainstream medical establishment. But the mainstream medical establishment is wrong so often about so many things. And... That's okay. That's the whole point about science is that it's not a religious doctrine that this is the way it is and these are eternal truths and if you question them, you should be burned at the stake for heresy. The whole point of science is that we're constantly discovering and understanding new stuff and seeing things in new ways and all the rest of it. So uh, that's why I'm open to it, but I would still treat a virus as if it's a real thing you could contract and uh, uh, for the rest of this episode, I'll be talking about them that way. But I just want to just want to point people to the because they're so different from the other type of organisms, because they kind of don't have a life of their own, there are some people who say that. Anyway, um, then there's parasites. So the main thing that distinguishes parasites is they're way bigger than anything else we talked about. Some of them are obviously... Bigger in size? Yeah. Some of them are obviously like long. You might have seen pictures or videos of like six foot long tapeworms being pulled out of people or animals <laughs> and stuff like that. But actually, most of them are not that big. They are... Um, barely big enough for you to be able to see them you know and certainly they're easy but they're, st they're still easily seeable under a you know a microscope they're not that big like pin worms and thread worms which i think are the most common in the uh developed world uh you know like something like that like you can just about see them um but yeah they're much bigger what um so parasite as the name kind of um implies they go in and they um will take without giving anything va valuable back again. So um, as opposed to a symbiote, right? The idea of a symbiote is it'll come in and it will take, but it will also give. So a lot of what are called the beneficial and even sometimes the commensal bacteria, they would be more classified as symbiotes. They are taking something from you. They're feeding on what you are eating, often fiber, but it could also be carbs, could be amino acids, could be polyphenols. There are actually many things that bacteria eat, eat that we eat depending on what it is depending on the bacteria uh but then they also hopefully provide some stuff that's good for us the probiotic ones do for instance even that's a little bit uh uh what's the word up for debate i know there's some people who watch this channel who are big fans of ray pete who you know had the idea that basically the less bacteria you have the better they're not that beneficial but there's set like i think he just felt like they overall they were taking more than they give and, you know, they were creating more toxins, for instance, than they were providing. But there are certainly some bacteria who provide B12, who provide vitamin K2. You know, in fact, 
both of those are essential nutrients that only come from bacteria fermentation. People say that vitamin B12 is in animal food, but it's it's only in animal food because animal food has the bacteria that ferments the B12. Like basically B12 doesn't exist without the bacteria. So there's certainly good evidence that bacteria create some nutrients that we need. It's more arguable whether it's good to have loads of them or not, you know, and there's good strong arguments for either side, I would say, even beyond just Ray Pete's theories. Um, so that's that. Uh, parasites, I've uh, talked about them much, but yeah, so basically uh, they take without giving. Now, even those are exceptions, there are certain kind of, there are certain people who actually take parasites on purpose um, because of the health benefits. Hell nymphs, especially, for instance. I remember speaking to one woman who was a microbiome expert, a doctor, um, and she had clients who resolved all their health problems by taking a parasite, according to her. And I, I looked it up, and it is a thing that some people do. Um, so, again, very controversial. I'm not recommending it, but I'm just saying there's a lot of, as you could probably get starting to get the impression of here, there's a lot of not settled science when it comes to this, and we're only going to be giving more and more examples of that as we go through. But anyway, parasites generally, they're, they're bigger things that feed on you. And, in you know, in more, um, there's this idea that they only exist in whatever you're supposed to say, sort of third world countries now, but countries with poverty, you know, countries without proper sanitation, basically. Um, but I don't believe that's the case. Like, for some reason, animals have parasites. Everyone agrees on that. Uh, children often have parasites. That's still understood, even within, you know, Western nations, the US or whatever. Um, but for some reason, adult humans don't have parasites unless they've been to, like, tropical countries or countries of poor sanitation. That's the theory. Yeah, let me ask you this. And, you know, as you've mentioned, um, some bacteria are beneficial, some are not. It doesn't sound like any viruses are beneficial uh, parasites. And as you just mentioned, that's a controversial thing where there's potentially a, someone recommending that. Um, you know, are any parasites beneficial or it's pretty much no? As I said, I've heard stories that they are. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't know enough about it is the truth. I, I just mentioned these little snippets like for people if they want to do their own research, but I can't give any definitive conclusion. The very nature of the word parasite yeah. means not. But there may be some types of worms or whatever that are classified as parasites that that may be beneficial. Um, the, the, you know, there's whole schools of thought on this as well um, that are less, what's the word, practical than the one I just said. You know, there are people who feel that parasites are a good thing, that they all they do is eat diseased tissue and, and uh, therefore, like, trying to kill them is a bad idea because they are trying to help you. Um, I think they're probably people who've never been to, you know, these countries where you get bad parasites. I mean, I went to Bali uh, and got a parasite there and really didn't enjoy that. But again, there'll be some people who go and, you know, drink river water in whatever country like Bali is, should guarantee you get a parasite who are totally fine. So again, it, it always isn't as simple as some people make it seem. Um, <laughs> and maybe that's because they have no disease tissue and therefore the parasites are not bad for them, like some people claim. Maybe that's because their immune system is so strong that the parasite doesn't get a foothold, as other people claim. And maybe it's something else. You know, we we don't know for sure, I would say. Um, and then lastly, there's, yeah, fungal, which also includes uh, bacteria and yeast. Um, so fungus, uh, you know, when we talk, think about fungus, we only think of mushrooms, right? Um, but fungus also has spores. Generally, when they talk about fungal infections, they're actually not talking about fungal, they're to, uh, fung fungi. They're talking about yeast quite often. But they're kind of, sometimes they're used interchangeably. Again, I've seen theories of people who say that they are the same thing, uh, just in different states, like they can transform into each other. Don't know for sure if that's true either. There's so many things I'm saying, but I'm putting it out there as a theory. But yeah, let's assume they're different things. So yeah, uh, like candida, for instance, um, is off the most commonly talked about one. That is a yeast. That is my understanding, even though it's usually referred to as a, uh, a fungal infection. To answer your previous question uh there are some beneficial yeasts that are supposed to be um the only one that i have heard of that is commonly used in a therapeutic way is um sacrimonious curvaceae it's often recommended by functional medicine doctors and holistic practitioners and stuff like that as a good yeast 
Um, the idea being that it will suppress the action of bad yeasts and bad bacteria. So uh, that's generally what's good about it. I don't believe it creates any nutrients, but I think it suppresses some of the pathogenic organisms, especially the, patho the other pathogenic yeasts. Um, and then mold, as far as I'm concerned, there's, n there's no redeeming qualities to mold. The type of toxins that they create are worse than any other toxins. They're more poisonous. Um, the only redeeming quality to them is, like we talked about earlier, if you isolate them and extract certain poisons from them, they can have a therapeutic um, application, like um, penicillin and like statins that we mentioned the other day. Now, are statins a really good thing? <laughs> Maybe not, but it's anyway. Debatable. <laughs> uh, another common example of a mycotoxin um, that is, I would say, probably does have some beneficial application is the um, the ergo der derivatives. So LSD is the most famous one, which I would not recommend, and of course it's illegal almost everywhere. Um, but there are other kind of drugs of that class, like metagoline and lyseride, uh, which are dopamine agonists which i'm actually very keen on um so they're not actually mycotoxins but they're still uh derivatives from mold so i'll put them in that category maybe some people would class them as mycotoxins but they have they don't really seem to have toxicity anyway um so yeah there are some substances sub substances that molds create that seems to be beneficial and then yeah well i guess it go just go back to yeast for a second so yeast are made to ferment alcohol so some people would say that that's, you know, very beneficial. <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed. Now, again, that's talking about an out-of-the-body application, of course, but I saw some ridiculous story on Reddit, I don't know if it's true, of a person who heard of something called Auto Brewer Syndrome, which um, is basically where you have a, a yeast overgrowth that means that any carbohydrate you eat gets converted into alcohol. And this person apparently gave themselves like an enema of uh, yeasts so to create auto brewer syndrome inside themselves and then they were drunk 24 7 um, oh, wow. and got arrested for drunk driving and uh it was a whole thing they basically ruined the whole life of it i kind of felt like i had symptoms of this a few years ago when i was really struggling which i've talked about before in a, you know an old video um i would have a feeling as soon as i had any um carbohydrate i would feel drunk and I remember even saying to my wife, like, this is horrible. I hate it. I've never really enjoyed being drunk, except for in very specific circumstances. And she was like, I don't know what you're complaining about. Sounds all right to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, thinking clearly is important to me. So that's why yes. um, I was not that keen. But yeah, um, so I guess to some people that's a benefit, though. As I say, I had one anecdotal story of someone doing it to themselves <laughs> on purpose. Uh, but uh well, I suppose as well, going into the yeast, though, um, I was going to say, because there's lots of fermented foods out there that do have those health properties. I mean, of course, we're going external, you know, as you just said. So, Well, most fermented foods get, most fermented foods, that's bacteria. So if you're talking about oh, okay. your sauerkraut and your kimchi yeah. and stuff like that. But yeah, there is another exception, which is like your uh, kombucha and your jun, J-U-N. Um, and I'm not, I think. Not 100% sure about kefir, but I think that one as well. Um, they do have beneficial yeasts. But again, this is controversial. Not everyone thinks that they're actually beneficial. Um, they definitely produce some toxins. They definitely produce some beneficial compounds. So the only question is, is it worth it? And that's a judgment call, obviously, depending on who's judging it and maybe even depending on the situation. Um, so whether all these fermented, certainly fermented, drinks because they are fermented by yeasts it's a bit more controversial if they're beneficial with the fermented foods that seem to be mainly fermented by um, bacteria they're more generally considered to be beneficial like with less caveats and then i mentioned alcohol but you know bread is another example right uh yeast is used to, to rise bread and sourdough bread is where you don't add a yeast but you use whatever yeast is already in the environment to rise the bread um, so yeah, beneficial from those kind of perspectives, but health beneficial, I've seen very little, little evidence of that, uh, for those organisms. Well, thank you for going through that comprehensive list. Cause I also, it's, it's also too, just to give the understanding of, ah, this is the characteristics of these certain ones. And, and I definitely have some more questions on these, um, 
on these on these categories, but I'll leave those for later when we get down a little bit. So, but I just want to touch briefly on genetics. You know, wh- how, what role do, do our genes play in whether we're susceptible to these infections, to these invaders? Yeah, I mean, huge, I would say. It, it's a massive factor. So in two different ways. First of all, the overall functioning of our immune system. Um, genes play a significant role in that. Now, that doesn't mean if you have if you've been dealt a bad hand, there's nothing you can do. Like your lifestyle still plays a significant role in it. You know, in genetic insights, which is where we, you know, provide in my, one of my companies, we provide reports on all of this. We always this. It's fundamentally two things. It's a risk score, which tells you your genetic susceptibility. But then it's also, in most cases anyway, recommendations. So the fact that we have recommendations there is because it is possible to change it, right? It is possible to improve it. It is possible to reduce your risk. But yeah, um, so there's two different factors. First of all, how well the immune system functions in general. So um, if you have, you know, an excess of inflammatory um, immune system constituents and a lack of regulatory ones, then that will tend to mean you have a tendency to over respond to infections and of course to over respond to other toxins or even things that are neither but which your body is tagged as toxins like you know food allergies hay fever all that kind of stuff right so that's why your immune system tends to overreact to things that can create a problem uh not just in terms of autoimmunity and allergies and all the rest but also when you have an actual infection if you have too much of a inflammatory tendency and not enough of a regulatory tendency that can mean that you you know, feel really awful, basically, and it can even be life threatening, um, depending on the infection and the situation. And then the other thing is specifically, right, you might be susceptible to a specific type of infection. And that's why, you know, in Genetic Insights, we do have a collection of uh, infectious disease reports, which we've recently expanded significantly. I think we have dozens of um, common infectious diseases in there now. And you see, you might have a low or normal chance of having most infectious diseases but there might be a few that you do have a higher chance for and the exact mechanism by which that is the case is not always 100 percent clear but we're looking at correlation so we're saying people with this and this and this genetic variant um, will have a tendency will have a greater risk for having this kind of infection but maybe a lower risk for having this kind of infection and i always find this to be very accurate um, when i go through it with people uh, they, yeah, I did have that infection before, you know, like, like the, it's very, very common that um, the ones that people have a high risk for are things that they have suffered with. And so, as I said, we don't fully understand, in, in fact, even why that is. The immune system is one of the most complex of all the systems in the body. Um, I, I don't... <laughs> I'm often reluctant to say we don't fully understand it because I know a lot of people, times when people say that, they just mean I don't fully understand it. So, And that may be the case here, but I, I think in this case it isn't just me. I really think the whole the world doesn't understand it very well, and you can see that by the massive, uh, what's the word, conflict, disagreement in the whole field of immunology, which has really been thrown into you know center stage in the last, five years four years or so with the pandemic like there's a lot of stuff about immunity that is not agreed upon let's just put it that way whether it's natural immunity whether it's vaccines whether it's this whether it's that like top experts in the field fundamentally disagree or are ostracized or whatever well that's what what happens to me that's a good thing you know that people are disagreeing because it means that there are still people out there seeking the truth that's great but it also indicates to me that the field is not fully understood yet, that there is no, you know, oh, we we totally get this now. Like there is in some areas of biology, although less than we think <laughs> in some areas. But yeah, the immune system is just incredibly complicated. So um, there absolutely are genetic variants that make you more or less likely to get all kinds of infections and less likely to get less or more likely to get infections in general. Right, yeah, because it's not just an immune system. Like, as we've gone over in many areas of this podcast is your, um, you know, your thyroid. There's there's many, 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 many things of operating that I would assume could lead to whether or whether or not you are more susceptible. Absolutely, yeah. Thyroid is a great example. I didn't mention that earlier when it came to hormones. But yeah, actually, it's one of the most important. I'd say the thyroid and the adrenal hormones and the thymus peptides would be like your top 
hormonal factors, but they all matter. They all are important. As you discussed earlier about the infections, whether, because I'm, I'm in that space, especially in today's society, like whether somebody even knows that they have an infection. So, you know, like what would this, I mean, there's the obvious ones, like you cut yourself, you know, and you're like, oh, it's red, it's all that, and it hurts, and it's a bit achy. Like, okay, yeah, there's an infection there. But, um, you know, are there some that we can be totally unaware of, you know, and, and in the categories of the bacterial, the viral, the, um, no. oh, the, um, the mole, all those, the lists that I did before, you know, are some, um, worse culprits than others. Uh, yeah, definitely. And it also depends on the area. So there are some areas that are more susceptible to some of the organisms than others. Um, so yeah, I've been thinking about this question because I knew it was coming up and, the truth is it's actually not as easy to tell as you would think. And you would think, okay, maybe you and I can't tell, but if you go to a medical doctor with, you know, God knows how many years of training, it's certainly easy for them, right? Uh, I'd say maybe it is clinically because of pattern recognition. So they go, oh, it's one of these again. I know what this is, right? So in that sense, but scientifically, I would say it's not actually necessarily that that easy to delineate and it's not that clear. Um Again, the evidence I have for that is that there's so much disagreement about what causes different things to this day still. I mean, I gave examples of um, earlier about how, you know, the, the, for instance, the uh, the fact that uh, no one gets uh, uh, things like polio anymore. Um, you know, a lot of people would say that's because of vaccines, but some people question that and say it's because of nutritional differences. Some people question that and say that uh, it's actually because there was specific toxins or a specific toxin that was very prevalent at the time that as soon as they stopped using it, suddenly all the incidents of that disease went away. And there's, you know, there's kind of stuff like that that makes it not that clear. Even in the case that you said, you know, uh, let's say your skin has got a rash in it, right? Like how, how can you tell if that's caused by an infection or if that's caused by an allergy or if that's caused by uh, a toxic exposure, or if that's caused by a nutritional deficiency? The answer is not easily, and nor can your doctor. And often, nor does your doctor even try to. If you go in there with a rash, they will give you something to reduce the rash. They will not attempt to investigate what the root cause of that rash actually is in many cases, unless it's extremely bad, you know, and if it's life threatening, if it leads to open sores, which get, you know, which get an acute infection, which could threaten your life, then they might do. But in most cases, they'll, you know, give you a cream, give you a, maybe a cortisone shot or something like that, just to reduce the inflammation. And, uh, you know, or they're maybe not even that, maybe they'll just say, ah, it's just a rash, go away, you know, or maybe they'll tell you to put some <laughs> balm in it or something like that. But the point is, you may think that, you know, it's 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 easy to assume that some authority out there knows all the answers, but it's not actually necessarily the case. So a lot of the time we don't really know. But anyway, let me ask you a question. So how would we know? Well, if we've got an infection. So the most common obvious signs are inflammation, uh, redness, swelling, and pain. I think that would be, you know, the most clear things. The problem is all of those things could be caused by something else. And the most obvious example of that is allergies, which is, you know, accepted in the mainstream. So what those have in common is that they both indicate an immune system activation. How can you tell if your immune system is activating in response to something that should be benign, like dust or cat saliva or pollen or gluten or whatever? or whether it's reacting to something virulent, your E. coli, your candida, or whatever. How can you tell? The answer is it's not particularly easy. You certainly can't tell about testing, and often it's not even tested, right? So that's an example. Now, that's understood by mainstream medicine that it could be either. What's less understood by mainstream medicine is it could be a poison. Your body might have had some kind of contact with some kind of poison. And even in that case, they often refer to it as like a, an allergy, you know, like they'll say, have you started using a new laundry detergent? Have you started using a new skin product or something? I'm using the skin example because it's simple, right? Um, but then they're saying it's like an allergy. What if it's not an allergy? What if it's a perfectly reasonable response to something highly toxic that you're putting on your body? 
And the fact that everyone doesn't have it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. Maybe there's something wrong with them that they're that they're not having a response to a poison. You know, that's something that's again not you know simple, clear cut, black and white, right? That's that's a matter of opinion. Is it a good idea to get an immune response to a poison? Sorry, is it a good thing to get immune response to a poison? When you have the immune response and it's causing inflammation, redness, swelling, pain, etc., you don't think so, right? Like that sucks. Why I don't want that. But it's telling you there's something wrong, and maybe if it stops you using the poison 20 years later, you're going to be a lot better off than the person who didn't have an immune reaction to the same poison. So, you know, that's it's a judgment call that's hard to tell without the wisdom of time. Um, when you have an acute uh, infection, I think we're going to talk about the difference between these uh, imminently, then a temperature increase is a common sign of an infection as well. And it's one of the best ways to delineate that, especially a serious infection. So if um, uh, you, if you're having some symptoms like uh, allergies and intolerances, usually do not create like a significant increase in temperature. Poisoning still can and do though, so it still doesn't rule out the poisoning possibility. But often, poisoning and infection go hand in hand. So remember the the feeling bad from the uh, infection, as hard as it is to kind of get your head around this, it's not really the organism. Actually, everything I just said, the inflammation, the redness, the swelling, the pain, the temperature increase, these are all a result of your immune response, not the organism itself. That's an interesting thing to clarify. And so, um, and then the other thing is, a lot of the issue with the organism is not so much the organism from an experimental point of view, it is the poisons that they're creating. So whether it's your endotoxin or other toxins from bacteria, or you know, I used the example of alcohol and aldehydes created by yeast, or whether it's mycotoxins created by mold, or whether it's you know, part of the problem with parasites is that often they contain bacteria and viruses, which are then in turn also poisoning you. So if you kill a parasite, often you feel worse because then all the bacteria inside them are suddenly released, and they're you know, you've got a dead body rotting inside you, even if it's a small one, the parasite which was full of these other bad organisms. And so it's a whole minefield. So, um, yeah, because of that, because most of the symptoms of an infection are your own immune system, it's not as easy to tell if it is an infection or if it's simply your immune system responding to something else. Um, the practical way to be able to tell if it's a infection or not, to actually answer your question, <laughs> is the one that... Uh, doctors use which is give something that kills organisms and see if it works <laughs> that's pretty much what they do so you know use the example of the cut finger being swollen earlier so you know just give some antibiotics give the type of antibiotic that usually works for that situation and it would usually work in that case and then you know it was an infection that's really the only way to know for sure by the way which sounds crazy in in most cases now you can test like no one you know if you have a cut finger or whatever i don't believe that they ever test for organisms for that there are certain situations where they do test for organisms and we'll talk about that when we talk about the different areas certainly but i had an infection that was life-threatening that you know my ankle was swollen to three times the size it's the worst pain i've ever been in i was hospitalized they told me that they were gonna uh have to do some kind of surgery on me which involved cutting me open because they said there was like pressure building in the bone and they told me if i didn't do the surgery i was never going to walk again and um and i refused it and uh, and and uh, oh and this is the other thing they said well if you do the surgery it might well add another infection and you might have to do the surgery again but if you don't do it then you're never going to walk again so you have to do it and I ended up refusing it, and they pumped me full of uh, IV antibiotics. They pumped me full of IV painkillers. I knew it was bad when I cut it to the hospital, and you know, normally they go just sit over there or whatever. But they all came running around. They, they take you me... through straight away. Oh yeah, well they came through, and then the people kept trying to like, whoa, look at his ankle. You know, there's a lot of um, what's the word, rubber neckers in, in the medical <laughs> the emergency room, from my experience. Come look at this. Oh my <laughs> yeah. god. <laughs> Basically, yeah, it was. I mean, I guess it's only an ankle, right? It could have been the neck or something worse. But the point is, it was very swollen for an ankle. It was really bad. Anyway, 
all this surgical intervention, all these antibiotics, they never tested what organism is. They didn't, they didn't know what it is, if it was a bacteria, if it was this, if it was that. They had no idea. Like, that was never on the cards for them to even test this, for this life-threatening, we're going to do surgery, you're never going to walk again, all this stuff. They never bothered to test what it actually was. And this is pretty typical. And anyway, that's another story. I won't go into that one anymore. But yeah. the point is, yeah, that is usually how they tell. Uh, sometimes they'll test for the organism, but usually they'll just give you something that kills the type of organisms that usually cause that problem and see if it works. And also depending on, um, as you, like with you or, you know, something that's potentially life threatening, it's not like, okay, what's the practicality? Wait for the test or let's just give it now because, you know, we really need to get this solved. Yeah, that's true for acute, uh, infections. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's practical. I'm not criticizing that. Of course you don't, you would rather uh, resolve it, of course, than know what it is. But my point is that even in many life threatening situations, they never find out what it actually was. So the only way that they know it's an infection is if it responded to anti-infection agents. That's my point. Yeah, no, good point. And you uh, mentioned inflammation. So I wanted to ask you because, you know, my, my question is, you know, is inflammation um, the same as an infection? But what you've just, I've heard you say is that inflammation is our immune system's response to something. So because it's maybe not necessarily an infection, it could be something else. Absolutely. Yeah. And so inflammation suggests infection, especially in certain locations, um, but it does not guarantee it. And in this, it, again, you know, things have changed. Maybe 200 years ago, inflammation often was an infection, although it still could have been a poison. But in this day and age, it could easily be uh, autoimmunity, it could easily be an allergy, it can easily be um, our immune system re reacting to something other than an infection. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. We touched on this earlier, you know, what are what are the types of infections? Yeah, so, you know, most doctors would answer that question by categorizing it based on location, right? Um, and with all kinds of names that, you know, you probably, uh, most of them you've never heard of. But I'm going to simplify it. I would say that basically there's two types of infection for the point of view of our uh, viewers, stroke listeners. There's acute and chronic. So... Acute infections are dangerous. They are potentially life-threatening. Not necessarily, you know, if someone tells you you have acute infection, don't think you're going to die straight away. The point is they could lead to something life-threatening ultimately. And that's why doctors usually take them seriously, even if it's something as minor as, you know, you cut your finger and it's red and swollen or something like that. The reason why they care about that is because if they don't address it, it might spread. And the, the, usually the issue is if it spreads to your blood, then that's called sepsis, and then that can kill you like quickly within hours. So they're always concerned about acute acute infections. Yeah, I wanted um, to ask, you mentioned sepsis because I've heard that before, things like that. So can you just, is there, is it just any kind of infection that's just gone to the blood or what is it specifically? Yeah, uh, I think it's usually bacterial. Uh, it's not going to be viral or um, it, it could actually be uh, yeast, but that's extremely rare. But um, so, yeah, I think it's yeah basically bacterial. Okay. And it is, uh, yeah, life threatening because the blood goes everywhere. So that means the infection could go everywhere. Um, I would say the crucial 
thing about acute affections. This is not a, uh, what's the word, a rigid set in stone rule, but this is a practical rule, is that acute affections generally occur inside the boundary of the body from the immune system's point of view. So the immune system has a very specific idea of what is classed as inside and outside. So inside your mouth, for instance, that's still outside the body. Inside your nostrils, that's still outside the body. You may think of it as inside, but the point is it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually outside the body because stuff can get there, right? An insect can crawl in there, whatever. Certainly organisms can get in there. That's okay-ish from the immune system's point of view. It's not panicked about that. What the immune system panics about is if it breaks the boundary of the body and gets actually into the body. When it's, um, you know, where there's blood and stuff, again, let's just simplify it. If it's inside the body, then it is always an emergency from the immune system's point of view. And it will tend, uh, I think in every case, to create a acute response. So temperature increasing, you know, fever, potentially life-threatening, pain, you know, where, depending on where it is, that whole thing will not work well, not work properly. It's, it's all very dangerous, right? When it comes to acute infections, acute infections are medical emergencies. I don't have any commentary on them because I'm not a medical doctor. If you have an acute infection, you need to seek medical help. No matter how much you dislike doctors, I have a friend who hates them, can't stand them, refuses to ever see them, you know, and it's got him in trouble before. He's almost died because of it. Like, you've got to go and see a doctor when you have an acute infection, even if you are massively resistant to it. That is the one time that you absolutely definitely must, no matter what, no matter how resistant you are, because it's one of the things that they generally do well, I would say. Um, and you need the tools that they have at their disposal. You can't get that from a chemist or, uh, or my supplement store or anywhere else. You know, you've got to go to a doctor. You've got to go to a medical professional. So that's acute infections. However, as we talked about, acute infections in at least our part of the world rarely are much of an issue anymore because the medical establishment is competent to deal with them in, in most cases. I mean, we talked about <laughs> like the pandemic where they were putting in people on oxygen ventilators and, you know, killing them, which was obviously a bad idea from anyone who understands oxygen and CO2 and mitochondrial respiration and whatever, but whatever. We talked about that in the, uh, the episode where we talked about CO2 and, and, uh, Buteco. So check that out of that episode for me to explain why that was a bad idea. But overall, <laughs> in, uh, you know, to be fair to doctors, that was completely new disease, right? And within a few months, they they realized that that was not working and stopped doing it. Um, but, you know, generally, medical intervention, acute, uh, not generally, always, right? Uh, so, but there's the other type. So this is chronic infection. So we talked about chronic disease, like heart disease and stuff like that, but this is something different. So chronic what does it mean? It means to me long lasting, but also not life threatening. That's the key distinction. And so, um, and again, to delineate it, my way of looking at it is that it's outside the body. When you're referring to areas outside the body, what are you specifically referring to? Yeah, so the areas that are technically outside the body from your immune system's point of view are your mouth, um, the skin, obviously, uh, the lungs are technically outside the body. Um, you know, obviously you, you're breathing stuff in and out of them. So all of that is outside. So, uh, the, you know, the lungs have a lining to take the oxygen in and out. And so that's how it, um, uh, takes stuff in, but it considers lungs to be outside the body. Uh, the sinuses, the whole sinus cavities inside the head, the ear canal up until a certain point is uh, classified as being outside the body. Um, the uh, vagina, if you're a woman, the urethra, up until a certain point, some people classify bladder as outside the body, some people classify it as inside the body. I think technically it is inside, but it's often in that category of chronic infections because 
generally doctors aren't worried about you having a bladder infection unless it spreads to the kidneys um, or they're only worried about the possibility of it spreading to the kidneys. They're not worried about it staying in the bladder. So again, that kind of makes it seem like the bladder is the don't worry about it outside the body area from the immune system's point of view, but that's more gray area. And then lastly, the biggest area by far and probably the most problematic is the whole digestive tract. So there's the mouth, but then there's the esophagus, the stomach, the duodenum, the intestines, um, all the way to the, the other side. Um, that whole digestive tract is considered to be outside of the body. And if it does spread to an organism uh, organ that's connected to that, like the pancreas or the liver or the gallbladder, that is considered to be a serious infection and inside the body. Um, but that doesn't happen very often. And I think that's why usually, you know, in the same way that bladder infections, doctors generally don't worry about it that much unless they think it's going to spread to the kidneys. Similarly, they don't worry about intestinal infections that much unless they think there's a good chance it's going to spread to the, uh, like the pancreas or the liver. Uh, but it, it doesn't happen that often. That's why they're not that bothered about it. So usually. So yeah, those are the areas that are considered to be outside the body. And those are the areas where we tend to have chronic infections. Uh, now here's the issue. You only really need to have a chronic infection in one of those locations, or at least one at a time, for your whole immune system to be dysregulated. So like I said, those areas are technically outside the body, but nonetheless, your immune system isn't happy with there being some kind of pathogen, you know, there, um, making a home there. Most of these places, even including the skin, but certainly all the others, these are permeable. So even if the organism isn't necessarily getting through to the other side, the toxins that they're creating usually are because the toxins are smaller than the organism itself. So, you know, like in the digestive tract, the E. coli usually is not getting into the bloodstream through the intestines, but the endotoxin that the E. coli is creating is getting through the bloodstream. And so the immune system is not happy about that situation of it being there. And the immune system is trying to address it. Same for the sinuses, same for the lungs, same for all of these places that I just listed. Um, if there's a chronic infection there, your your immune system has a, uh, what's the word, a presence um, outside the body. With it. So, you know, all of these different surfaces are kind of like skin. They're more permeable. But the other thing they have in common with all of them, except for the um, mouth, is that they usually have like a layer of uh, mucus or saliva or something like that. So uh, to form a kind of another barrier between the skin and the outside world, and that's where there are still immune system constituents. You still do have white blood cells and antibodies and stuff in your saliva, and you have it in the, the, you know, the mucus in the intestines, and you have it in the mucus in the sinuses and the lungs and all the rest of it. And so there is still immune system activation. And so when you have a chronic infection, so the pathogen is there and it's causing problems, but they're not severe enough to have a to for the immune system to create a full on um, uh, a full response. Redness, swelling, pain, temperature increase, all the rest of it. But they're just there. What happens is the immune system becomes chronically overstimulated and dysregulated, and over time, the ratio of those inflammatory agents the interleukins and stuff goes up and the regulatory ones that keeps them from being overstimulated goes down and that's where you have all kinds of other inflammatory issues so we talked about earlier about the immune system over responding to infections the immune system overreacting to allergens perceived allergens the immune system overreacting to toxic agents and how that creates a lot of suffering and pain and all the rest of it, well, a underlying and unresolved chronic infection is often one of the root causes of that immune system regulation. And that immune system regulation doesn't just cause pain and swelling and discomfort and all the rest of it. It also uses up energy. So all the other systems of your body will have less energy available to them. You will have less energy available to you. You may be more tired. You may have more brain fog. 
then if you still need to function and work and think clearly, you have to have stress chemicals to counteract that. You need adrenaline and cortisol and all the rest of it. And the other ones that are, I would class as stress chemicals, but maybe not everyone would, like estrogen and stuff like that. So you need those stress chemicals to be high. Then that means that you're going to burn through your reserves of you know important nutrients more. It also, those stress chemicals exacerbate this tendency for the inflammatory components of the immune system to be dominant over the regulatory part of the immune system. And you can end up in this dysregulated position where you're inflamed, you're imbalanced, you're stressed, you're depleted, you're tired, and that, and then also often in a, uh, the immune system and the detoxification system, while they're bound together and the actual immune system's kind of both, the specific kind of strategies of the immune system between fighting infections and dealing with toxins is in some ways opposite. So one of the primary things that kills organisms is oxygen. And so hydrogen peroxide, you probably know what that is. It's like a bleach. People sometimes use to bleach their hair. Sometimes these it's cleaning and stuff like that. So hydrogen peroxide literally means there is one atom of hydrogen per oxide. So H2O is like hydrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, but hydrogen peroxide is hydrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen. And what that means is there's a spare oxygen, an oxidizing agent that can kill a lot of different organisms. That's why some hardcore alternative people use hydrogen peroxide to, you know, kill infections in, in various different ways. And um, let's talk about one use of that in my recommendations. Um, but your body creates that itself. Now, a lot of the detoxification system is actually an antioxidant. It's things like glutathione and superoxide dismutase, which have this kind of opposite function. And so when you chronically have this oxidizing inflammatory system on, it starts to deplete and downregulate the activity of this um, antioxidant innate, you know, not taking antioxidants in supplements and foods and stuff, but innate antioxidant systems start to downregulate. And then you're in a position where um, you're, you start to have a toxin buildup and you know, your mitochondria are dependent on the correct amount of these oxidative uh, electrons, not too many, not too little, but they can start to get excessive and then you get mitochondrial dysregulation. And I mean, I could go on and on and on, but you can see there's so many things that can go wrong and it could start with just a gum infection, just a sinus infection, just a fungal infection on your foot or whatever. These basic things that a lot of people take for granted i'm not saying it's always the cause the people want to blame toxins in the environment they're often right too the people who want to blame nutritional deficiencies they're often right too you know i'm not the people who want to blame lifestyle issues like staring at screens all day they're often right too i'm not saying it's only one thing but i'm saying this can be one root cause that if unaddressed can just ruin everything else the knock-on effect it really is like that domino that just can keep going and going and going yeah and I'm passionate about this because for me, this is really being the thing. Like I've resolved so many other issues. I don't have any kind of metabolic issues and all the kind of stuff going to all kinds of testing. And yet the thing that has been my kind of Achilles heel is these chronic infections that my body hasn't been able to deal with. I think for many reasons, for one, because my body was overwhelmed with toxins. I've talked before about the very high levels of lead that I still have in my blood. Another reason is my thyroid was underactive. I've talked about that before in previous episodes. So I won't, you know, rehash all of that. But I think because of that and other factors, you know, my body had these chronic systemic infections that really um, kind of wormed their way in there. And they these these pathogenic organisms are quite intelligent. You know, there are I've read a few books about this a long time ago now. I think Howard Bloom was one of them. I remember off the top of my head, like. The, uh, like one bacteria does not have the intelligence of a human being, but all the bacteria are in a specific class. They seem to actually have a very high level of intelligence. And some people say that they're a lot more sophisticated in both pursuing their agenda and also developing chemical weapons and all the rest of it than humans are. Like 
Some people do talk about that. I think even in the mainstream a bit, they talk about how like we're in an arms race in the context of antibiotics, that antibiotics are like evolving faster than our ability to deal with them. Um, but as I said, I've read some people who go way beyond that to say, you know, like th they're very sophisticated. And so anyway, um, there are a few in the same way that like there's a lot of different type of criminals out there. Let's use this as an analogy. So like the dumb criminals might like uh, stick a gun in your face, ask for your wallet and then shoot you and kill you. But the smart criminal will um, get you working for them for the rest of your life and take, you know, almost all your money and leave you just enough to survive, right? That's the smart criminal, which sometimes we refer to as government <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> but, um, you know, but not just government, right? Mafia, the mafia is a, a good example of that, right? They come and take their protection money every week. There's a lot smarter to come and take your protection money every week for years and decades and ultimately maybe, you know, extort and take over the whole business or whatever, rather than give me your money, you just get what's in the wallet and then that's it, right? So there's different strategies for how to be a criminal. And so a few pathogens have like the stick up mugger mentality. They just go in and kill you. And that's what we're talking about, the acute infections. But the majority of the pathogens are more like the mafia types they will, you know, use you as a source of resources, but they'll actually happily live in you for years and decades and make you a nice little home and protect themselves and insulate themselves like Teflon Don from any, making sure your immune system can't touch them and, you know, happily poison you on an ongoing basis, happily feed on your nutrition on an ongoing basis and just kind of exploit you for the rest of your life rather than outright just killing you. And so that's, I guess, my little analogy for the difference between acute and chronic infections and why chronic infections are so insidious. They're not an emergency in the same way someone coming and extorting you for protection money every week is not as big a deal as someone who stabs you to death and takes your wallet, but it's also not good. <laughs> it's also uh, uh, really you know, zapping the quality of your life and ultimately may lead to your ruin anyway. And so I think that's a, that's a fair analogy for it. That's a really good analogy because, I mean, as you were talking about the signs and symptoms earlier with the, you know, the fever and the pain and things like that, you know, the redness, the swelling, you know, those are like all like, oh, okay, okay, maybe it might not be an infection. It could be something else. But it also seems like these chronic infections that are there, there's not so many of these warning signs. They could just be like, oh, I feel a little under the weather. Oh, things may be not so right. Exactly. And they can often be put down to other things these days, right? Like, oh, my sinus is bothering me again. It's an allergy. Or, oh, I've got a rash again. It, you know, it's whatever clothing I've been wearing. Or, oh, you know, I, I'm feeling, uh, well, whatever. I mean, there's so many things with the intestines. But I'm feeling tired. I'm feeling, you know, bloated or whatever. It's something I ate, right? We don't think about that there could be an infectious component to it in many cases these days. I think because we feel like we've conquered the infection world, to some degree justifiably so, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, um, we often don't think that it could still be this low-lying infection, that this, uh, this chronic infection, this sneaky infection that is actually ruining everything. Absolutely. And so you, um, you, we know we discussed what's, uh, you know, where these chronic infections are, which is the outside of the body. So, you know, let's look at these in a deeper way, you know, like where do we get these chronic infections? You know, what kinds are there, you know, how can we sort it out and, um, and go into it in a, in a deeper way? How does that sound? Yeah. Well, I'd say let's go for a general strategy for how to deal with chronic infections, and then we'll go for all the specifics. Is that okay? Okay, perfect. Yeah, great. All right. Okay. So general strategy, um, I think, first of all, and this is the stuff I see missing within, as I say, some practitioners. That's why I want to talk about it. And obviously, certainly within the mainstream medical world, they never talk about this stuff. And the reason it's important to me is because I tried the kind of usual natural herbal whatever ways of getting rid of chronic infections and had absolutely no success and and in fact just felt worse 
And I later learned this because this stuff wasn't addressed at the outset. And some, to be fair, some naturopaths and nutritionists and all the rest are aware of this stuff. So I'm not saying I'm the only one, but it's not as well known as it should be. So I just want to talk about this first. So yeah, first thing is increasing your vitality in general. You know, we've talked about this before, metabolism, mitochondrial energy, like if all the cells in your body are struggling or eking out what little energy is available to them. It is possible that you can just take some garlic or oregano or whatever these, you know, natural home remedies that you sometimes see people recommend in little YouTube, you know, Instagram clips and whatnot, and that, that all be it. And it's resolved it for you, but it's significantly less likely because you really need your immune system to do its part. And if your whole system is struggling for lack of energy, your immune system will also be struggling for lack of energy. And in fact, it's more likely to be. So we talked earlier about how there's this compromise between the immune system and the detoxification system. Well, there's a bigger compromise between both and the adrenal system. So when your body feels like there's an emergency, I might die, which is where adrenaline and cortisol spike, the immune system and detoxification system, which are, again, connected, are massively down-regulated. And so that's another part of it, is to get out of this adrenalized state. Um, and a lot of the time that involves resolving the thyroid, absolutely, and possibly often secondarily as well, the, the sex hormones, you know? So uh, things that I would test and optimize in that regard are uh, cortisol, uh, free T3, free T4, TSH, uh, estradiol, testosterone, free testosterone, prolactin, and then ideally DHT, if you can get that as well. And if any of those are suboptimal, that's not going to help. That's going to get in the way of your body being able to effectively deal with these infections. Of everything I just said, as I said earlier, uh, thyroid and adrenals are the most important. So getting that cortisol not low, but to a kind of reasonable medium level and getting that free T3 near the top of the reference range, that's going to put you in a really great position. Um, why does that matter? So temperature actually makes a really big difference to the effective um ability of your immune system to perform properly uh, i don't know if this is 100 percent accurate i've only heard it anecdotally i haven't looked into it in depth but i've heard many people say that the difference between a even a one degree difference in temperature and that's your one degree a fahrenheit difference chrissy so the difference between being 97.5 and 98.5 and for our european friends i think that's something like 36.5 to 37 the difference between those two could be a 10 times difference in the effective, optimal activity of the immune system. So it's huge. So why do both of those matter? So the thyroid is the thing that turns up the volume, or more accurately, turns up the temperature of the metabolism in general. But the adrenals are the thing that... Uh, coordinates and controls the stability of the temperature and you actually need both of those to be optimal so it's probably better to go from you know 97 to 98 to 97 to 98 than it is to just stay at 97 because it means you have periods of your immune system yeah, yeah. kind of well, like mean, heart rate variability you know something like that maybe you know in a different way but you know through the adrenals well what I'm saying is if your temperature is optimal four hours a day, it's better than if it's optimal zero hours a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I am saying it's not much better. And actually, to use the other extreme, if your temperature is optimal 12 hours a day, it's it's not half as good as having it be optimal 24 hours a day. It might be a fifth as good, like 20% as good. Like, like there's a lot of value in having it consistently high. Because if your immune system is ramping up and then totally calming down, then ramping up and then calming down, ramping, it, it can never do its work properly. So it's very consistent to get the temperature up 
37 or 98.6 and keep it there for okay. an extended period of time, which is not particularly necessarily easy to do if you have a history of a lot of chronic stress caused by whatever, you know, it could be numerous factors as we have talked about many times and talked about a little bit today. Um, but getting those two dialed in is an essential key to getting your immune system to work really well. Now, that's not to say if you have an infection and you go to the doctor and give you antibiotics and it goes away, great. If you have an infection, you go to some natural herbal person, they say to take garlic or whatever and that works for you, great. But I'm talking to the people who that didn't work for or probably actually more likely it came back again, right? Or it keeps coming back. So that then indicates that there's something else going on. And the temperature and the thyroid adrenal will be one of the first places I would start. Another thing is toxicity. Right. So once you've got that dialed in, the temperature, the adrenals, the thyroids, probably the sex hormones as well. If it's if you're still not doing your best, if your immune system's still struggling, if you still have a tendency for allergies and stuff, if you still have a tendency for immune system overactivating inflammation, then the next thing to think is, huh. OK, so my immune system is able to function now because I've got my temperature nice and good. So. Uh, why is it still dysregulated? And it may well be some kind of chronic infection, but if we're talking about how you've tried to address that and it hasn't worked, then it could be some kind of toxicity. And I said, for me, you know, I ascertained it was a very specific toxin. I'm not generally full of toxicity. There's a specific one for me. For you, you might be generally full of toxicity. So there's specific markers that you can test to see if your body is generally struggling. And then there's specific markers you can test to see if there's specific toxins that your body's struggling with. Now, that can often be expensive to test every toxin that could be bothering you. It can be expensive even to test like the most common ones. So that's where genetic insights can be very helpful because it can tell you which toxins you tend to struggle with. And other toxins, I even you know, classify things that are often called sensitivities, things like oxalates, things like salicylates, um, things like lectins. These are kind of toxins, depending on how you look at it. Um, they are innately toxic. It's just that they should be no big deal to the body in an ideal world. But sometimes they are a big deal to the body. They are have a very strong toxic effect because the immune system is dysregulated. But also sometimes they have a, a strong toxic effect just because genetically a person isn't able to handle them very well. And so that's very important information to know. And then you can test that, you know, whether you have an issue of heavy metals or molds or oxalates or uh, uh, alcohols or whatever it might be. You can test, uh, test for those specific things and see if you actually have an issue with that in reality. So it can help you narrow down what to test for. So that can be useful. Um, and then address that. It's not always easier to address. It's easier to address if your thyroid and adrenal is already optimized, which is why I suggested that first, right? Um, now, also, I could have said this one first. In fact, I usually do. It's just random. Uh, nutrients. Nutrients is the other one, right? Are there any nutrients that your body is low in? They could be nutrients that are essential for your immune system to function correctly. We talked before about, you know, zinc and D3 are the ones that are most commonly talked about. But, you know, zinc is... Um, antagonistic to copper and iron and molybdenum so if you just take loads of zinc you can then deplete your level all three of the other ones you know um even you know magnesium is commonly recommended by everyone including me but if you take loads of magnesium for extended periods of time it can deplete your potassium which can create a new problem so ideally again this is not your first port of call but i'm talking about people who struggle repeatedly with chronic infections either with the same one over and over, or like as soon as you resolve one, you get a different one, that kind of thing. I would recommend testing nutrients, testing, you know, uh, all the vitamins, all the uh, essential minerals, and also, yeah, ideally all the amino acids, all the essential fats, and seeing what's going on. See if there's anything that you're particularly low on, because that's all food and fuel for your immune system to work properly. So what I'm hearing and understanding really as well is that a lot of these things that you're recommending, one, they're going to help with, you know, with these chronic infections. But overall, really, it's something that we should all be doing anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely. It's just, you know, people need motivation to uh, do what they should do anyway in most cases, including me, you know. So 
for, for one person, they may do it because they're starting to look older and they're like, oh, that's not good. What can I do about it? For some, per you know, for another person, it's because they've got a chronic infection somewhere that keeps bothering them. For another person, it's because, you know, for fitness reasons, for another person, it's pain or whatever, you know, that like whatever motivates you to do all this basic stuff is <laughs> is good. But yes, 100 percent, Chrissy, this is the exact same advice I'd give for <laughs> almost any situation. <laughs> but it is a very relevant, especially here, I would say, because of the um, the importance that the temperature has to the immune system function specifically. Um, I mean, it's important for everything, but. Uh, the immune the immune system is you know probably one of the most affected by a person just being one degree lower than they should be. And it also speaks to the point too is if somebody's like I've tried so much I've tried so much but nothing's working and then if they haven't addressed this which is exactly why you gave this general strategy list especially according to the temperature then that could be the one thing that's keeping them back. Exactly. Ellen, this episode has been highly educational, and I know we still have so much more to go. So we're going to take a pause here. We will continue this topic. So do you want to um, let our listeners know what's coming up in part two? Yes, we'll make sure we do part two next week so we don't leave you hanging. And um, so what I'll do is I'll give a specific strategy. I'll just outline it, brief, outline it briefly here, and I'll, I'll recap, recap again at the beginning of the next episode. So the usual strategies that I focus on are um, hygiene. So is there some kind of cleaning, uh, flushing that needs to be involved in the situation? Like for the mouth, for instance, you know, it's not just about taking uh, any kind of substance. It's also about just getting the debris out of there, right? With brushing and flossing and into dental brushes and stuff like that. There's removing, right? So it's like, how do we actually kill those organisms? Sometimes that's simple, but if you're watching this, you may well be in that camp that I have been in of where it's often not. And so we need to understand um, what works for each specific situation. Um, then the soothing strokes rebalancing. So even once we've dealt with the infection, we may still actually have all the symptoms because as we talked about earlier, the symptoms are caused by the immune system activation, not by the thing, not by the pathogen. And so how do we calm that immune system back down if it needs help with that, which it often does in the case of a chronic infection where you've had the issue for years, even decades, um, and get things back into balance. And then sometimes there's a recolonize step as well where we have to not just calm the situation down but get the good stuff going again, whether it's the immune system, whether it's mucus, whether it's good organisms, we kind of have to get the good stuff back in place. So I'm going to give a strategy for that for the mouth, for the skin, for the sinuses, for the lungs, for the ears, for the urinary tract and bladder, for the stomach and the esophagus, and then for the small and large intestine. So all of that's to come in the next episode. Wonderful. Thank you, Ellen. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We sure do hope that you enjoyed this content. And if you do, please make sure you leave your comments below, like, like the episode, and please make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss us on the next one. And we'll see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here, if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below, if you want to click on that one and watch that next.